Hello and welcome once again. I'm Imran Garda and you're in the stream. Today, more than 100 dead in Yemen's latest violence. But is the world too obsessed, perhaps, with Libya and Syria to notice? Mayal Hassan is back with us for a second day running. Welcome, May. Nice to have you again. Stepping in, of course, into the shoes of Ahmed Shihabuddin, who's in Arizona attending Google Zeitgeist. He can tell us all about it when he returns. Next to May, also for a second day running on the couch, is Adriano Farano, an entrepreneur, a digital entrepreneur and CEO of Tactilize. Adriano, good to have you back on the infamous orange couch. Any stories you've been following in the past 24 hours or so? Yeah, you know, here um, in Washington, it's interesting to follow the presidential race. So uh, it's funny because the, the president uh, actually flew to uh, my backyard in uh, Woodside, California. And he gave an interesting speech uh, in a fundraiser meeting saying that uh, the presidential race is going to be a battle of values, a battle of, uh, on who we are. It's an interesting shift from the um, recent uh, conversations, debates about jobs, economics, and you all know the, the sentence that uh, Bill Clinton used, uh, the economic stupid, right? Mm. So uh, I think that it's, it's interesting because for him it's so hard today to uh, really compete on the mm. economics side because of uh, his uh, uh, bad legacy. Uh, but on the other hand, it's so easy for him to compete on the values side yeah. because the Republicans are becoming crazy. <laughs> and of course, when you play the values card, nobody can really um, oppose you on that. They can't, they can't be course. against all these wholesome things. As an outsider, I, I've noticed this as well, coming into the States, being here for the past year or so. I've noticed... Uh, this political game that's that's being played as well. So yeah. I'm glad that there's so somebody I, else. That's I, I think it, it's really his interest that somebody like uh, um, Perry is going to win the nomination versus Romney. The, the more radical mm. the, the competitor is going to be, the, the best for him. Okay, interesting times ahead, particularly with regards to the U.S. presidential race. But that's a whole other topic. Perhaps we will, no doubt we will, be covering that in uh, the weeks and months ahead. Let us know what stories matter to you, of course. You can follow us on Twitter and send us a tweet with the hashtag AJStream. We could feature your suggestion, of course, in a future episode. On September 25th, Al Jazeera English reported on Saudi King Abdullah's decision to allow women to run as candidates for municipal polls. Women will have the right to vote in 2015. Related to that, we had Muhammad Wakas, who asked us if we're going to do a show on this story. This story, ironically, comes on the heels of a breaking news story coming out of Saudi on Tuesday about the sentencing of two Saudi women to 10 lashings for driving. N. Ashad tipped us off to the story. She even suggested we follow at w to drive who revealed that one of the women who was sentenced drove way back in 1991. Then let us look at some tweet reactions that we have gotten from the narcissist. He asks us who's going to drive them to the voting ballot boxes. Voting is an illusion of participation. And then from Salahuddin, he sarcastically concludes, maybe they can vote in order to drive. We covered the story about Saudi women driving last June on this show. For continuing coverage, follow hashtag women to drive and at w to drive. If you want to make your voice heard, send us your views, videos, or photos using the hashtag AJStream so that we can feature them in the show. Many of you are already tweeting us right now with your questions and comments. Here's a look at who is feeding the stream. Now, first Tunisia, then Egypt, and of course, something that's been ongoing, Libya. The Arab Spring has swept through North Africa and the Middle East, unseating three leaders so far. But as the world watches events unfold, a pro-democracy uprising in another country is perhaps not getting the same attention. In Yemen, protesters have been urging President Ali Abdullah Saleh to leave since February. Let's have a look at uh, a video of the latest violence which has erupted in the past week or so. And uh, this is fairly 
disturbing. Of course, we can't completely independently verify uh, this video, but it appears to show a cameraman. It appears to show a man filming in the streets of the capital. Uh, Sana'a, moments later, his camera drops after the sound of a gunshot. There you have it. Now, protesters say the victim was a cameraman trying to get footage of Yemeni government snipers when he was shot and uh, he ultimately filmed what seems to be his own death. Let me show you uh, a, a protest that has taken place recently as well, calling for uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh to step down and for the international community to intervene and for civilians to be saved. More than 100 people, of course, have been killed in those most recent clashes between security forces and activists in Change Square. That's the epicenter of the protests in Sana'a. Now, protesters blame President Saleh for widespread corruption, poverty and lawlessness and they want him to leave. Now, for his part, Saleh says he will abide by a Gulf Cooperation Council, that's the GCC, you'll hear it quite often, a proposal by the GCC to transfer power. But he has backed out in the past and many feel that he might renege again. Well, joining us now via Skype is Yemeni doctor and activist Hamza Shakabi, who runs a video blog, Revolutionary Updates. Also with us is blogger Basim Sabri, who's following the Arab Spring closely. Welcome, uh, both of you, to the stream. Gentlemen, Hamza, if I could start with you, uh, I understand you have treated many victims of uh, security force brutality, people who have been shot at these marches and rallies. Give us a, an idea of, of what that must have, must have been like. Well, uh, first off, uh, I, uh, the, the last time I had faced this was like a couple of months ago. Uh, and uh, the most horrific incidents that I have faced during the protests was in the March the 18th. And uh, the, the, the regime in Yemen cannot uh, comprehend uh, that people in the country have had enough. And they, the, the, the forces of the regime, it came now to the point that they are shooting RPG uh, at, at protesters uh, point blank. Uh, people were shot in the past week in the face by RPGs and by anti-artillery uh, uh, bullets along with anti-aircraft bullets. The images that came out were absolutely heroic. It's, it, they're, they're, the, the, the words can actually carry more than, than words, uh, the, the, the images can carry more than words can regarding all of those crimes. And, and now it came to the point that uh, not only the regime is using uh, his security forces along with the international aid that has been given to fight terrorism against the protesters, but they are hiring uh, snipers from, from Somalia now. Mm -hmm. So th they are taking this to the to the Libyan uh, example to the left. Hamza, Hamza, sorry to, to come in there. You have uh, Brigadier General uh, Mohsin, uh, Ali Mohsin Al Ahmed, and and some people with him, some troops with him, who have sided now with the demonstrators. Um, are they fighting for the people on the streets, or are they fighting for themselves? Well, uh, what happened? What happened exactly? Uh, as we're from the people in there who actually told me this, uh, uh, what happened was the the protesters wanted to cross a certain point that they didn't go to through the past uh, months, the age of the revolution, and uh, they were surprised by 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 the shooting from from uh, armed civilians. Uh, mercenaries, if you will, as I said, using heavy artillery and uh, RPGs used against unarmed protesters. Uh, what happened was that they found themselves in the position to shoot back. Mm -hmm. Whether they are fighting for themselves or they're fighting for the sake of the protesters, I think uh, it came to the point now 
it, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't, I don't see why is this question okay. uh, so persistent in, in so many news outlets. Uh, unarmed civilian protesters, peaceful, coming out of the streets day in, day out since months, and they have never been faced with anything again but pr brutality. There is nothing more to be said about all this. Okay. I mean, why, why put uh, so much emphasis on on why uh, does Ali Mohsen fight instead of putting the pressure on this criminal regime that is killing people in this okay. heinous? It's a uh, it's a fair uh, point. Manner for months now. Hamza, it's a fair point, but it was a question that needs to be asked and uh, analyzed. Before I go to May to have a look at some of the feedback from the community, I, I want to bring Basim in. Basim, how different do you think Yemen is to the other countries that are on the menu, if you like, in the Arab Spring? The Tunisias, the Libyas, the Egypts and the Bahrains. Is there anything particularly unique to Yemen or are there many common threads with these other countries? I think there is absolutely so many things that are very different about Yemen. I mean, for example, Yemen does not present the clear uh, strategic interest that, I mean, Yemen is definitely very strategically important for many reasons, but it doesn't register with many ordinary Arabs in the same way as other uh, countries. For example, uh, Egypt has always been the anchor or the political heavyweight of the Middle East, uh, the, the compass, if you will. Uh, Syria is a frontline country with Israel and all sorts of conspiracy theories are surrounding. Tunisia, of course, was the starting line. And, and, and I think one of the most important or one of the most defining characteristics of, of the Yemeni revolution is that, and it's both a good and a bad thing at the same time, that the opposition, uh, JMP and others, sort of have taken control or have at least asserted their influence over the protests. So instead of being a pro predominantly leaderless revolution against a regime, it's starting to take the shape, at least in popular uh, image, starting to take the shape that it's more of an internal faction uh, fighting between two opposing political forces that have had their feuds for quite a while. And, and, and again, because Yemen has always had a, a very tenuous and problematic history of civil war, uh, many also seem to not be too surprised by what's happening, which is quite disturbing. I mean, they, they refer to the previous civil wars in 94 and, and before that and, and all the... So, so Yemen has many things that are definitely quite different okay. um, about it. Okay, let's go to May now for, for some feedback and then we'll bring Adriano There's in. tons of feedback. Um, there's a question from Moi à Table, table I'm assuming this is French. Scary that the number of deaths becomes an antidote, anecdote in daily reports on Yemen. Does media really think the main story is Saleh? So we've been hearing on um, some international media that this is a big deal because Saleh returned. But there's so much more going on, I guess she's saying. Who's that for? Whoever wants to take it. How about Hamza? Go for it. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't read the question. Uh, there there seems to be uh, uh, May saying that some of the feedback says there's too much attention on the return of Ali Abdullah Saleh and, and not the fact that people are being massacred on the streets. Do you think that there's too much emphasis on his personality? Of course, there, and which is which is ridiculous. That's that's absolutely true, and it is under under meaning of of all the sacrifices that the people of Yemen have put uh, through through the past month. And uh, he is it, people would like to ignore all of this and and focus on his character as as a player on the political scene rather than focusing on the disaster that is on the ground. Mm -hmm. Adriano, you want to come in there? Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, so, so, sorry to be um, uh, cynic, but um, I have a question about the branding. Do you guys think that uh, the Yemen protesters are effectively branding the, themselves? I mean, part of the success of uh, mm, Tunisians and Egyptians uh, being able to raise um, uh, awareness uh, mm. on, on the world scene 
was the fact that they were able to uh, communicate quite effectively using uh, uh, social media and so on. So oh, okay. how good are you guys in, uh, in this okay. job? Well, let's, let's ask you know, Hamza about this, and then maybe Basim can, can address it in a broader scale. Hamza, uh, you, I, you, you... Sorry, I, I just don't want to... Before we get into the, the branding thing, I just want to make a small interjection about the whole deaths issue, if, yes. if I could, okay. um, which is basically that we need to be uh, understanding of the fact that perhaps since the past 10 years in particular, people have been used on a daily level when watching other news channels have been used to hear stories of people dying every single day. And what has that done to us is that it has really uh, desensitized us to the concept of, of people dying and the images of watching people dying on television and, and reading about it in the news, especially since the war in Iraq began, unfortunately is no longer of sufficient shocking factor, which is a a horrible thing, and I'm sorry if I interrupted. That, but that, I just that's fair that enough. It's it's a it's a scathing indictment of, of us all. Let's let's go to Hamza and get Hamza as a Yemeni activist to answer the issue of branding. Do you think that there's a, if you like, uh, as I build upon Adriano's question, a PR problem in many ways? You are articulate. You speak English. You have a video blog. You have another blog, which actually I'll, I'll call up uh, at this moment in time. Let me call it up here. It's uh, somewhere over here. Late night surgery. And you, you know, you you say some very powerful things on your on your blog there. For example, one of them. Let me just highlight it here, and I'll read it out for the viewers. People are dying on the streets because of tyrants, and what everybody is lending is another lecture on what to do. I will tell you what to do. Uh, shut up and and do something. I mean, it's a fairly you know passionate blog post. You speak English. You're articulate. You're appealing to both the Arab world and the English speaking world. I I perhaps you don't have a problem with branding or highlighting the plight of the Yemenis to the world, but do you think in general that Yemen is a little bit behind the likes of Egypt and Libya in that regard? Okay, uh, this brings me to the idea of how people perceive Yemen. Yemen in, in general and in, in the, in the head of the uh, academics and diplomats, even in the public, Yemen is the backyard of Saudi Arabia where terrorists hatch and where Al-Qaeda, the Arab Peninsula, is going to go over and take over the world and bomb everyone up. This is absurd, and no one is willing to listen or to perceive or see beyond that. So I think it, it goes more to the responsibility of the mainstream media outlets and people who are actually to be listened to the the quote unquote Yemen experts. Now everyone is a Yemen slash terrorism mm -hmm. expert. There is no that no one is discussing Yemen as as a country. O always Yemen is discussed throughout the line of of anti-terrorism activities. And no matter what you say, I have talked to so many uh, Western media outlets, and I've been always asked the, stupid, the same stupid question regarding terrorism. How do you stand against? terrorism how do you uh, de-associate yourself uh, regarding terrorism but this person it's it's ridiculous we have been talking in right left and the center but the only story that clicks with people is terrorism and and there there are uh, we are doing so much in the in the uh, in the cyberspace but apparently people are it, it is not an interesting story we only came out just because of the killings. Yes. Uh, the, the, the Yemen story has been totally denied by media outlets for months now. The only thing okay. that brought us back is that the, the, the dozens of heroes that we had to see in pieces it's for, for people to, to wake up, and that... the, which, is, which is scary. And that's, people cannot say that we are not marketing the cause enough because no matter what we do, if people are not listening, if people are not willing to listen, then we have, we have a few more of a serious problem. Hamza, Hamza that's articulate and, and profound. And uh, I mean, uh, that is an impassionate, uh, impassioned plea. Let's go, go to May for some more feedback now uh, from our community. Twitter users are sounding off on this issue of the failure of branding the Yemeni revolution. And two things are mainly coming up. One um, is this issue of it's just portrayed as an Al-Qaeda um, training ground, right? So Raja Al-Thabani, -Al her comment is, 
so much media coverage focuses on Al-Qaeda Arabian Peninsula in Yemen when there are more terrorists here in my hometown of Brooklyn. Then we have another comment I think I want you guys to go into, and this is from Jess H. And she says, I think the Western media can't get its head around Yemen. Quagmires are big turnoff for most commercial media outlets. So I want to ask you, um, Hamza, is, is it possible that people are not catching on to the story because it is so complicated and we have factions and, and tribes and so much more that we don't have a history about here or in the rest of the world? Well, this is, this is actually the core, one of the cores of the problem. And, 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 and I believe it begins with the, with the diplomats that the world is sending to Yemen. The diplomats are watching Yemen just like someone is watching TV. They're not, they're not really paying attention. You, everyone sends diplomats to other countries to understand the context. And apparently in Yemen, this has been a major failure. No one in the diplomat and the diplomatic uh, community really tries to understand what's going on. You, you, will, try, you will find fractions and parties and uh, all sorts of differences everywhere in the world, but the, the problem is, are, you, uh, are people trying to understand this? And the, the, the problem, as I said, starts with the diplomats and ascend sense to the academic okay. and everyone who's visiting, they are, they are actually looking in the same, as I said, uh, anti-terrorism uh, context rather than uh, what is really going on. Okay, and Hamza, Hamza. Terrorism, terrorism actually pays for, for a lot of bills. Fair point, fair point, Hamza. I want to bring Basim in here. Uh, Basim, talking about those diplomats and talking about the quote-unquote international community, there is no possibility of a compromise or resolution in Yemen without Riyadh and Washington. Is that not true? It's impossible to have any sort of resolution without those two big players. Well, if we talk about, I mean, it's actually the one thing that the Arab revolutions or the Arab Spring has, has sort of confirmed is that there is no such thing as impossibility. If, if the ground and if the forces on the ground are strong enough, a resolution is going to impose itself. The, the importance of Washington and Riyadh is if, if we're trying to reach a compromise before things escalate even further to the degree of a full-scale civil war or something close to that. So, so if we are talking about a peaceful, there's no such thing as peaceful, it's no longer peaceful. But uh, let's say a, a non-further escalated uh, compromise, then definitely Washington and Riyadh, and particularly Riyadh, I should add, are very important in that regard. Okay, Basim and Hamza, stay with us. We'll continue the discussion in the post show, which you can catch on stream.aljazeera.com. Adriano, just about a minute and a half left on the program. Some thoughts? I, I still think that there, there is this branding problem. Um, it's it's a useful just to you know to to complain about the West that is not listening i think mm -hmm. that uh, you know if you are um, uh, an opinion leader a protester and you want really to change the things of your country you do have to articulate just like those guys are doing my concern is that maybe there are not enough people like that um, and then of course the, also the western media have a part of the mm -hmm. uh, responsibility but i i'm sure i bet that if more people like this emerge uh, their voices are going to be heard let me show you a cartoon talking about branding and, and reaching out to uh, the world. This is a cartoon that is floating around uh, Twitter. You see Ali Abdullah Saleh leaving what seems like Sana'a in, in flames. And uh, he's got submachine guns basically as crutches. This alluding to that assassination attempt where he was badly charred and, and burned and injured. He spent some time in Saudi Arabia and then, of course, recently returned to Yemen. So it's semi-satirical. It's a sort of dark humor so you have a lot of uh, a lot of a, a political opinion in terms of cartoons on the internet particularly twitter these things being spread around with the hashtag uh, yemen may stay where you are adriano as well we'll continue the conversation with hamza and basim in the post show don't go away
Welcome back to the post show. It seems as if we're, we've just started getting into uh, the meat of the discussion. So much to say, so little time uh, as always. Hamza and, and Basim are back on Skype. Let's, let's go to Hamza. Hamza, there's something I want to ask you. It's related to what Basim had mentioned a bit earlier on, the fact that Yemen is in, in many ways unique when you talk about the Arab Spring. And unfortunately for Yemen, for, for those Yemenis who are calling for greater democracy, somehow Yemen doesn't tick many of these national interest boxes for a lot of, a lot of the global powers, whether it's the European Union or, or the United States, etc. So, so while the United States may have been happy to conduct some drone strikes to fight Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, there, there aren't many other greater aspects to it. For example, like Libya, perhaps, which has oil, which is on the, on the doorstep of, of Europe. And that, in a way hinders any protest movement because big powers are going to do so much, but they may not do enough in order to usher in democracy in your country. Do you feel that that is a, a cynical view or do you think that it's, it's quite accurate? Well, uh, you're asking me whether uh, people in Yemen are, uh, like they, how they're perceiving the, the intervention from, from, from uh, other superpowers in the world? Or? Yes, and, and how, how Yemen compares to other places where, for <laughs> example, a place like Libya, where NATO imposed a no-fly zone, where you had this, this sort of weight and this well, push of the international community. Uh, is there a feeling that perhaps Yemen doesn't tick all these boxes for these big nations so that there isn't that pressure? Well, of course, Yemen, as I said, it's, it's, it's only perceived as, as, uh, as a country where terrorism has. And this is the only this is the only way we can deal with it. So send the drones, uh, send uh, intelligence, send uh, uh, military aid, but nothing beyond that. Okay. And uh, of the the problem is that uh, the everyone would like everyone likes to perceive Yemen as a complicated thing that nobody nobody would like to understand. And I heard this from several. Even, even political advisors in, in, in embassies in Yemen, they say, we spent four years here and we have no idea how the, how the, the, the society functions. Well, it, it is because you suck at your job, because you don't do your job properly. <laughs> if you were doing your job properly, you would have understood. Like the, the embassy, a certain embassy, for example, of a European country has been in the country since the 60s. You should have learned something meanwhile. You've been here for 40 years or so. You should have learned something, but no. People, the, the diplomats in Yemen would like to sit back and watch the, watch the country and try to understand it as much as I try to understand the physiology of Chewbacca, for example. But they, 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 it, 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 it's not working. They should really, try, they should really work harder to, to penetrate how, how the country is functioning. To, to in, in order to be able to, to have a decision, a wise decision about it. And the, in the other hand, uh, if we have witnessed anything in, in, in both regional and international uh, intervention in Yemen, it's been actually more supportive of Ali Saleh, not of, of anyone else. Right. If there has been, who, who gives someone killing all those people immunity and like everyone has been rallying about the GCC initiative even if it proposed killing people yeah like like me I I, I, I lost a couple of friends in the in the in the in the protest several of my friends got got injured even last week and and this is one of my greatest regrets that that I'm not with there with them right now and if, I don't know how would I feel if if I was killed and then Ali Saleh got immunity. That that's mm. just that's just not right. Yeah, just a reminder that uh, that GCC proposal, which was spearheaded by the Saudis, offered immunity uh, to uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh in exchange for him transferring power and having some sort of uh, transition towards uh, a multi-party uh, democracy. Perhaps uh, may <laughs> the Twitter's fear is lighting up on this uh, it, topic. Isn't it's, it? I don't know how I keep up with it. I think this question is best asked to Hamza. It asks from Ibi Ibrahim, 
what do the protesters in the square wish for Yemenis abroad to do? And I, before you answer that, I want to bring Bassman to the conversation afterwards to, to just think about this question in broader terms for the rest of the Arab world. Does international intervention help or hurt the, the revolutions in other countries? Okay, okay. Let's, uh, let's start with Hamza. Let's take it in bite-sized chunks. Start yeah. with Hamza. What do Yemenis abroad, uh, what do Ye those protesters want the Yemenis abroad to do? Let's tackle that first. Well, first off, uh, pe uh, people from abroad should understand the, the, the pressures laid out on the protests on the street. Nobody can understand how does it feel to be out of electricity 18, 20, 22 hours a day and not being able to drive. I mean, I, people who are actually, people cannot even get to the squares at times because they cannot drive. They, they do not have fuel. Uh, some people got, well, a lot of people got fired. So the, even people who are participating, they have less ability to be there because of the pressures they dumped on them. I had so many things that I could have downloaded and uh, uploaded on the internet on the right time, but I couldn't because I didn't have electricity in the, in the house. The, there are so many pressures, political, uh, tribal, uh, uh, financial that are laid upon the, the protesters on the ground that, that make it impossible in, 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 in ideal situations. Uh, number, the, the other thing is, uh, would be uh, people who are actually uh, living in, in other countries and who actually can understand how do uh, institutions function in those countries? They, they should move uh, in sync with the revolution uh, to, to, uh, to expose assets of the regime's uh, men, to uh, issue uh, warrants, mm -hmm. and to expose. We have to work from Yemen to do these things. And we, we, you have a lot of... You, we had a lot of people being in a okay. grave danger just because they mobilized such documents. And if, if when, when if Yemenis abroad actually caught up on this, and some of them are doing a very great job, and I know some of them, and the, the things would uh, move faster. Okay. Let's go to Basim now to answer May's question about whether international intervention across the Arab world helps or hinders the process, whether it muddies the water or makes <clears throat> things clearer. Okay. Well, um, I want to I use an example, the Libyan example, okay? Why was the Libyan example a successful uh, example of international intervention? And why was it sort of um, accepted in a way, more, more or less? If you look at Libya, I mean, setting aside the fact that it's not, for example, contiguous to, to Israel, the, the main problem or the main strategic problem in the Middle East, um, and, and of course, setting aside the question of, of, of oil, which was definitely a certain raison d'etre of, of entering this, this conflict to begin with, there were two issues. The first was that Gaddafi himself was an absolute comic figure that no one, no one absolutely, I mean, everyone genuinely thought we would be better off without. Some people pragmatically actually kind of worry, as Hamza was talking about, um, the Al-Qaeda's threat and so on and so, and some people seem a little bit hesitant about Saleh and, and think that there is some sort of equilibrium on the ground and and so on. And, and so international intervention would seem as if that they are taking sides at the moment. But Libya, what was special about it was that a group of revolutionaries stood from the ground and literally went from the east of the country all the way until the west fighting on the ground. And then suddenly... Gaddafi started to mount his counterattack, and it got really strong. That after months of jubilation and celebration, he was on the on the doorsteps of of Benghazi, and he was threatening a massacre, an absolute massacre. And that threat of a massacre was the reason why the international community's capacity to use force was actually acceptable, because the revolutionaries was all were just at the doorsteps of Tripoli and then now threatened with with extinction okay. in a way. So okay. 
Let, let, yeah. Let's bring Adriano yeah. in here. Yeah, very, very quick question. Are you guys going to, I mean, is, is your wish to stick to the non-violent uh, protests or are you ready for a Libya scenario when it's actually Who, more uh, like a civil war? Who's that for, Hamza? Uh, yeah. Hamza? Well, actually, the, uh, the, the military standoff has already begun uh, regardless of what the protesters' choices might be. Because it well when when at, it it actually changed at the point when the when uh, when uh, soldiers from the first armored division uh, decided to step in, and because it's it's human thing you cannot no no one can see a human being being splattered by an RPG and stand still that alone is a crime and they did it they stepped in, and I think this is. This is going to, uh, to to take the whole issue, the whole revolution, into a different uh, level. Okay. Riskily. Okay. Gentlemen and lady, <laughs> I think that's uh, just about enough. It's a good point to wrap things up on. Thank you very much, Hamza and, and Basim. It was really My uh, pleasure. insightful and, My pleasure. And, and very deep and, and revealing. It was a good discussion to have with both of you over Skype. Adriano, thanks for joining us once again. Good to have you on the show. Hope to Thank have you, you on the much. show uh, sometime soon. Yeah, why future. not? Flying from San Francisco. Why not? And Al Jazeera will pay for it, I, I think. Okay. So I heard. May, good to have you filling in for Ahmed. Hope Thank to see you, you again soon. Me. Hope you enjoyed uh, the I experience. Did. I wish well. we had a post post show. Yeah, the post 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 show. We'll we'll pitch that to our superiors. Thanks for watching on stream.aljazeera.com. In a couple of hours' time, this will be uploaded. If you missed anything, you can watch the entire discussion again. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.